Thousands of tourists opened to visitors in 1955. Near the entrance to the Kremlin is the tomb of Lenin and Stalin. Regardless of leaf, there's hardly a visitor to Russia's capital who fails to go through the dimly lighted mausoleum. Crowds are often lined up for blocks. Their reverence for the tomb and the embalmed bodies of Lenin and Stalin helped to make the Kremlin the center of Russian life. Whether in communist headquarters in Odessa on the Black Sea or in Leningrad, every activity is controlled by directives that originate. Although famous old St. Basil's Cathedral in Red Square is now a museum, the churches of the Soviet Union apparently operate without governmental restriction. The Russian Orthodox is still the major denomination, but there are countless synagogues, Catholic and Protestant churches, and mosques of the Moslem. The churches are well attended, noticeably by the aged. Religion is frowned upon in Soviet schools. Most young Russians are educated to believe that atheism is the true faith. The downtown streets of a big city like Moscow look much like those of a busy city in the States, without the familiar signs and trademarks. While the sidewalks are crowded, the streets are almost empty. No need for traffic signals here, because very few people own automobiles. The government stresses the production of heavy goods rather than consumer products. Consequently, public transportation is both rapid and regular, with the average bus fare the equivalent of 12 and a half cents. The crowded buses take workers past countless reminders of Russian history. Statues of czars and czarinas, Russian warriors of the country's long and turbulent past, and contemporary statues dedicated to today's workers. Russian children lead a different life than the children in our own country. At an early age, the Russian child is taught to think of himself as primarily part of it. often seen marching along the crowded sidewalks. The state takes charge of the children almost as soon as they're born. When they're six months old, they spend at least part of every day at a state-operated nursery school, while their parents are at work or engaged in government service. When the child is seven, he goes to a regular school. Their activities are closely guided by adults who are also employees of some of the many departments of the government. While they may play games, there's a purpose for everything. And physical training is an important part of the program. Scientific and mechanical courses are stressed, even in the elementary grades. Academic standards are very high and classes are held six days a week. Roll call is taken as the children enter the school. Both men and women are employed as teachers. When a child is seven, he also becomes a member of the communist youth organization, the Young Pioneers. Here is additional opportunity for political indoctrination and physical training. Ten years later, at 17, he becomes a member of the Young Communist League. This leads in another ten years to eligibility for membership in the Communist Party. But only a comparative few are accepted as full-fledged party members. In fact, for many years, party membership has been held by less than 3% of all adult Russians. Strong body is as necessary as a trained mind. Everyone strives hard for the highest possible achievement. A source of pride to all Russians is Moscow University. It has an enrollment of 22,000. An outstanding student is exempt from military service. He'll be paid by the government while studying. Education and culture are important to the Russian people. The Bolshoi Theater, government supported, is the scene of many ballet performances. Under the Department of Culture, children may learn ballet. To work hard and become a star performer, 
can be a Russian child's dream as well as an American's. But here the state controls the dancing schools and the theaters. Motion pictures, radio, and television are also functions of the government. The average Russian is interested in art, both traveling exhibitions of contemporary work and permanent museums. In the Hermitage at Leningrad are such masterpieces as A Self-Portrait by Van Dyck, Mary Magdalene by Titian, and The Priceless Madonna Lita by Leonardo da Vinci. The desire for learning and culture makes reading popular, so book stands are to be found everywhere. The government turns out an enormous amount of printed matter in many languages, including English. Every newspaper, book, and magazine must first be approved by a government agency. Food and soft drinks also are sold on the streets. Even these vendors have a government quota to meet. One of the country's most popular beverages is a soft drink made from rye grain. These outdoor stands also serve as unofficial recreation centers. This is GUM, spelled G-U-M, and meaning complete government department store. Located on Red Square, it's the largest department store in the Soviet Union. It's only a series of small shops along covered arcades. Clothing, household fixtures and appliances and food are offered here in limited quantities, all produced by the state. The food displays are plaster and wax. Real food is too scarce to be used for window displays. Consumer demand for all merchandise far exceeds the supply. We have visited the city of Moscow, capital of the Soviet Union. Now we are going south over the Caucasus Mountains headed for the Republic of Georgia, one of the republics making up the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Georgia is bordered on the west by the Black Sea, on the south by Turkey. The capital of Georgia is the ancient city of Tbilisi, once known as Tiflis or Tiflis. The hills and the cliffs and the warm Mediterranean climate of Tbilisi are far different from Moscow's flat terrain and cold winters. The late Joseph Stalin was once a student at this religious seminary. The new capital building of Georgia with its contemporary Soviet architecture and the inevitable statue of Lenin contrast sharply with the daily life of the Georgian people who still live much as their ancestors did hundreds of years ago. In Georgia, as throughout Russia, there are two kinds of markets. The state-controlled market where prices are set by law, no haggling or bargaining is permitted. And the so-called free market, such as we visit here, the prices in the free market are whatever the seller can get. The sellers have all produced their own goods because it's against the law to be a middleman. To buy and resell for profit is a crime. Strangely enough, bread, the single most important item in the Russian menu, is not allowed to be sold in the free market. Bread can be sold only at a state-controlled store. The average price of a loaf of bread is one ruble twelve kopecks, the equivalent of thirty-seven cents. Where does the Russian food come from? Some food is raised in all parts of the Soviet, but the Republic of the Ukraine is known as the breadbasket of the Russian people. The country's agriculture is carried on at collective farms. In the early days of communism, the government literally collected all the private farms into huge tracts of land owned and operated by the state. Mechanization of the thousands of collective farms throughout Russia has been slow. Most of the work is still done by horses and by manual labor, often by women, with men above military age acting as supervisors. 
Younger men are usually in military service or in some other branch of government work. In addition to working on the collective farm as a government employee, every farm worker is allowed to consider as his own a piece of land, a little larger than an acre. Whatever he raises there, he may sell and keep the profits for himself after paying a tax to the state. During the school year, the children of the farm area go directly from school to an agricultural center where they learn farming methods prescribed by directives from Moscow. As in the city, they go to school six days a week. Moving farther south to the Crimean Peninsula, we can go by train. The engineers and the conductors are often women, freeing men for more essential work. Along the north shore of the Black Sea is the Crimean Peninsula, and the city of Yalta, a small port on the southern tip. With its moderate climate, Yalta is the Soviet's most popular vacation resort. It's a busy city, typical of many in the Soviet Union, where the citizens are busily engaged in making their labor and production quotas. There's much building underway all over the country. New housing and new roads are necessary for an expanding population and to replace many outdated facilities. Modern machinery is used, but much of the labor is still done by hand. Along the Crimean coast are numerous castles of former royalty, some of which were used for the historic Yalta meetings of World War II between Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. Applying their trades in the manner of their forefathers without modern implements are the craftsmen. Here are the knife grinder and the cobbler. Like all other workers, they're government employees. The factory workers of the Soviet are members of one of the country's trade unions. They operate much like factory social clubs, but without the right to strike or bargain. The factory management is held responsible for adequate housing for its workers. The average Russian prefers an apartment to a small house with a garden. That's considered old-fashioned. In the larger cities, elaborate hotels are provided for the tourists and the traveling delegation. They offer fine facilities and feature the popular Russian food, fresh caviar. But many upper-class city dwellers live in three- and four-room apartments. The rent is based on the family income. Almost all apartment buildings provide a playground for the children of the tenants. The mother in this family is a supervisor in the factory we visited. Her little girl, Tasha, will start to school next year. Tasha's father is a captain in the Russian Navy. While he's home on leave, he spends much of his time listening to radio broadcasts from Moscow. Television is not as common as in the United States. The furnishings of this typical upper-class apartment appear old-fashioned to us. Every piece was made in the Soviet Union. For dinner, the family will have borscht, one of the mainstays of the Russian diet. Borscht is a cross between a heavy soup and a thin stew. What goes into it depends on the season of the year, the family budget, and the cook's taste. There are seven main varieties. When the borscht is done after four to six hours of slow cooking, the final touch, a raw egg, is added. Russian families seldom eat alone. They often invite friends or relatives to savor the borscht, followed in this case by a light summer meal. And always the bread and sweet butter and fresh caviar. But not all Russian homes are so comfortable. About one half of the people live in crowded apartments. They would be considered slums by American standards. There are usually several occupants to every room. But regardless of income, medical needs will be taken care of to the state-operated clinic or hospital. Doctors and nurses are trained by these of the city of the old palaces and residents have been taken
by the government and converted into vacation resorts. Vacations are furnished without charge for each particular job. The worker has little usually on the Black Sea, taxation, before to work under the quota system. Chess and poker are favorite pastimes. If you're not a government-sponsored trip, accommodations may not be so good, but knows. These vacations are impossible if the worker had to pay his own way, for the average wage is less than $100 a month. After the long and severe winters, vacationers are eager for the sun beach, even though the water is seldom warm enough for comfortable swimming. There's relaxing, of course, and maybe even an occasional bit of fishing. Fitness is always uppermost in their minds. When a child is attending regular school, He'll spend every summer, whether he likes it or not, at a young pioneer's camp. Part of every summer day is devoted to recreation, physical training, and sports. Strong and healthy young people are considered essential to meet the country's manpower shortage. These are not only the men and women of tomorrow, but more important, they're the of tomorrow. Part of every summer day also is spent in political indoctrination. Russian people of every age and in every phase of life are controlled by directives from Moscow. The gold domes of the Kremlin symbolize the all-powerful communist government of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics.